Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the key points that Julian the Emperor, also known as Julian the Apostate, really wants to drive home in his oration number six to the uneducated cynics is precisely that, that these people calling themselves cynics are uneducated, that means undeveloped, they have mistaken ideas about what they're doing, and they're acting in essence like a bunch of jackasses for no good reason actually to their own harm and the harm of other people and they're missing the whole point of the cynic philosophy as a philosophy of practice, a philosophy that is lived out. And so we can ask, well, what is the point of cynic philosophy? And, and here's where you could bring cynics in and, and put them to the test. If they say something like, well, I'm just holding up the mirror to society, man, you know, like old hippies used to do. Probably not a real cynic if they're like, well, you know, this is going to make me an influencer on pick whatever social media you like. Mm, probably not a real cynic if they say, oh, I just want to withdraw from everybody and everything and get away from it all. That's not really being a cynic either. There's, there's more to it according to Julian, at least, and I think that he's, he's probably on the right track when we look at the examples of Antisthenes or Diogenes or other classic cynics. So what, what is the point of cynic philosophy? He tells us point blank, it is like with every philosophy, passes philosophias, happiness, eudaimonia, the thing that, that ancient Greek philosophy was centered around. And really this, this runs throughout uh, Roman philosophy, you know, into the middle ages. And what, what does this look like then for the cynic? So one formulation that he uses is living in accordance with nature, which sounds vaguely stoic, right? Because the Stoics said similar things. And then he says, uh, not in line, not in accordance with the opinion of the vulgar crowd or multitude. So not common opinions. By the way, I want to point one thing out in here. He does, he's not saying that it's automatically bad to um, believe the crowd. He actually says for people who are, you know, not that, that learned, it can be a good thing. It's better than having no principles whatsoever. Um, it's, it's, you know, better than, than, uh, just being entirely on their own, right? Because we're social creatures, but for the people who have genuine knowledge, who have developed their minds, we should try to figure out what our nature really is. And this goes back to the self-knowledge thing that he began with at the beginning. So that's a key thing. And that leads into talking about self-knowledge, knowledge of what we are, what kind of creature we are. We are not just plants. We are not just animals. We have a faculty of reason. We are rational souls connected with bodies, right? And we can look at the faculties of the soul and the parts of the body and figure out how we ought to live, what makes sense for us as human beings. We also want to have freedom from passion, if possible, apatheia, right? That is not being moved by things like, as he brings up, envy or wrath or anger or uh, all sorts of other passions, desire, right? We don't want to be steered around by these things. We don't want them to, as we could say, run the show, dictate to us who we're going to be. And 
we also want to try to, as much as possible, be like the gods. The gods are rational. The gods have this sort of freedom. They, they don't indulge themselves, contrary to, you know, the old Homeric stories. Um, you know, he says, freedom from passion is the end and the aim. This is equivalent to being a god. And this can take place in many different ways. He's also got this great discussion about being free more generally, not being a slave. So we, we have to take a look at what he's saying here. Um, he tells us that for mankind, freedom is the beginning of all good things. What people are always calling good, how can you deny it? Property, money, birth, physical strength, beauty, and in a word, everything of that sort when divorced from freedom are surely blessings that belong not to him who merely seems to enjoy him, but to him who is that man's master. So think about this, money, property, beauty, pleasure. Those things can be taken away from you in an instant or perhaps over a long process. But if somebody else is in control of them, you're not really free if that's where you put your value. You can enjoy them as Antisthenes, you know, did uh, in, in, in his own time talking about, you know, enjoying fine wine at a symposium. But if you, if you desire it, if you hanker after it, if that's what you orient your life around, you're not really free. He tells us that who are we to regard as a slave? Is it the person that we buy for a certain amount of money? And he says, you'll probably say that such a person is truly a slave. Why? Because we paid down money for him. And he says, well, in that case, prisoners of wars are, are slaves. Who is really a slave is uh, the person over whom another person has the power to compel them to do whatever they order. And if they refuse to punish them, and in the word of the poet to inflict grievous pains upon them. So we can be slaves even if we are rich, even if we're influential, even if we're powerful, we can still be slaves, slaves to our appetites, slaves to whoever panders to those appetites. And he says, consider next whether we have not as many masters as there are persons whom we are obliged to conciliate in order to not suffer pain or annoyance from being punished by them, right? There's all sorts of ways of, of, of losing out on, on things. So, you know, the goal of, of cynic philosophy is freedom as much as we can. Happiness, living in accordance with nature, being uh, able to develop our rational faculties. He also has this great discussion. He says, well, where does happiness reside in us? Where should we be looking for it? Should it be in an external things like our possessions or even our body? You know, if you're good looking, should that be where your happiness is? You're looking in the mirror all the time. Nowadays, you can like take selfies with your phone. Oh, look at me with this filter. Look at me over here. Here's a cornfield behind me or, you know, whatever other flower thing is, 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 is you know, sunflowers for a while are the going thing, right? Oh, look at me. Well, that can go away very quickly. That's not really where you should be putting all of your happiness. Now, is it? And it, not only is it stupid because it's an insecure thing, it's rather arbitrary. Your looks aren't really you, or if they are you, that's pretty sad, right? A cynic would, would tell you. So he, he goes on and he, he tells us, um, here we go. We must not be too busy about happiness as if it were hidden away outside ourselves. Isn't that an interesting turn of phrase? as if happiness is something we have to go on a scavenger hunt for. Oh, is it over there? Is it over here? No, that maybe it's in a magazine, maybe it's in a website, maybe uh, you know, some, some self-help guru has the happiness that you're looking for, or an investment person, right? He says, we must not be busy about it as if it were outside of ourselves. Neither the eagle, nor the plane tree, nor anything else that has life vainly troubles itself about wings or leaves of gold, or that its shoots may be of silver, or its stings and spurs of iron, or rather of adamant. But where nature in the beginning adorned them with such things, they consider with that if they're only strong and serviceable for speed or defense, they're good. So isn't it absurd when a human being tries to find happiness somewhere outside of ourself? And, and you could respond, he doesn't do that, but you could respond and say, yeah, but other animals don't have technology. They don't have society. We, we have culture. 
we can look at other people and be like, that guy's higher, that guy's lower, you know, vote him up, vote him down or pick whatever else you, you like. And he says, it's absurd when a human being tries to find happiness somewhere outside of themselves and thinks that wealth, birth, influence of friends and anything of that sort is of the utmost importance. Why? He says, we have a soul that does not resemble other animals. We are different. We are rational. And he says, whether it be different in essence or not different in essence, but superior in its activity, I don't really care. What matters is that the, our minds, the best and noblest part of ourselves, that is where happiness resides. It's not only in the soul, it's in the best part of our soul. So then that leads us to a question. Okay, so we figured out what happiness is, where it resides. How do we get it? What are the means for acquiring happiness? And there's a number of important means. I think you can think of these as self reinforcing or mutually reinforcing, right? So the first thing that he says at a couple different points is following reason, <laughs> paying attention to what reason says, as opposed to just following our appetites or listening to what any, you know, schmuck who happens to have a whole bunch of followers or some TV personality. They don't know necessarily what's good for us. Follow reason, follow rational people as well. And the more that you do that, the closer you're going to get to happiness. So you have to follow the dictates of reason. And as he says, the God within mind, noose, the, the higher faculty that reveals to us what we ought to be doing, what we ought to be thinking. And this is a, you know, he says this at multiple points. This is quite important. He says that um, the cynic is characterized by reason and a certain plan of life, right? And we also use that faculty of reason to do some of these other things. So another thing that we need to do, and there's many different ways to do this, is to subdue and subordinate the body and the emotional parts of the soul. So it's not just letting the soul do whatever it wants. We have to have a well-structured soul, right? Um, but subordinating the body is very important. And he gives some examples. He says, consider whether Diogenes did not above all other men, all other men profess this belief that, you know, we need to cultivate happiness. He freely exposed his body to hardships so he might make it stronger than it was by nature. He allowed himself to act only as the light of reason shows us we ought to act and the perturbations that attack the soul and are derived from the body uh, he did not take into account at all. Thus, by means of this discipline, right, by disciplining the self and the body, he made his body more vigorous than any of those who contended for the prize of a crown in the game. And his soul was so disposed, he was happy and a king no less, if not even more than the great king, as the Greeks used to call him in those days, by which they meant the, Greek, the uh, king of Persia, right? So there, that's one set of things that we can do. He also talks about the need to um, make sure that we subordinate the parts of our soul that are striving after sensual pleasures, that are striving after honor, the, you know, the appetitive and thumatic part of the soul. It's very important to get those in rain. And if, if we don't do that, we're going to be in, in trouble. Now, does that mean we have to be like totally abstemious? No, he says Diogenes would sometimes visit a courtesan, uh, but, you know, just to satisfy a few things and then, and then move on after that, right? So we could develop uh, virtues. And, and so that's key. He also talks about something else that I think is really interesting here in this text. He tells us that the person who wants to be a cynic ought first to censure severely and cross-examine himself and without any self-flattery, ask himself the following questions in precise terms. So we could say, to be very crude, 
no bullshitting. You're going to like look at yourself in the unvarnished, harsh light of the sun and ask yourself, where are you really? So here's the questions he says. Do you enjoy expensive food? Can you do without a soft bed? Are you the slave of rewards and the opinion of other people? Is it your ambition to attract public notice? And even though that be an empty honor, still think it worthwhile, right? These are the things that you need to think about. You need to question yourself about. And if you do that, you can say, oh, yeah, man, <laughs> I, I do want that stuff. And then you can start to attack it. Now you can actually bring to bear the resources of reason against it. So this leads us then to the problems that uh, Julian is diagnosing in contemporary cynics. Remember, this is an oration to the uneducated cynics. He's telling these people, man, you're doing it wrong. You're getting things screwed up. So how are they, how are they going astray? He talks about them and he uses certain terms, shameless, impudent, scorners. And he, you know, he uses examples of particular people who are doing this, this sort of stuff. <clears throat> you know, this is not what Crates or Diogenes or Antisthenes or even Plato or Aristotle were engaging in. But there are some contemporary cynics that are like this, right? They're scorning other people. Now, they're doing something that Diogenes himself often did or Antisthenes did, but they're doing it in the wrong way for the wrong reasons. He says that they're like brute animals. And by this, he doesn't mean just that they are trying to live in an uncultivated way as possible and, you know, uh, pee in the open like dogs or, you know, eat raw meat or stuff like that. He means that they are not mastering that emotional and desirous part of ourselves. They're slaves to their appetites. So if Diogenes, as he did, masturbates in the marketplace and says afterwards, oh, if it was only so easy to appease my hunger by rubbing my belly, um, that could have some sort of point of like teaching a lesson to people about, you know, social conventions. But a lot of these people are doing that because they, they enjoy getting off or they enjoy stealing other people's food, or they want to show off and get, you know, the, the approval of the crowd. That's not the cynic lifestyle. Another thing he talks about is in, in indulging in what we can translate as freedom of speech or frankness of speech, parousia in Greek, meaning the capacity to say whatever you want to people. And he says that, no, this is something you actually have to earn. And he's got an interesting example here of a case where Diogenes uh, hears this, this uh, guy, um, here we go, once when in a crowd of people among whom was Diogenes, a certain youth made an unseemly noise. Diogenes struck him with his staff and said, and so vile wretch though you have done nothing that would give you the right to take such liberties in public, you're beginning here and before us to show us your scorn of opinion. There's other places where he talks about, you know, this freedom of speech that you, you, you know, the cynic has to earn it. They have to show that they are in a certain sense above. They're not just a buffoon to ridicule people or stuff like that. There's another really great section here where he talks about the costume of cynics. And he tells us, let him who wishes to be a cynic philosopher not adopt merely their long cloak or wallet or staff or their way of wearing the hair as though he were like a man walking uh, in shaved and illiterate in a villa that, that village that lacked barber shops and schools. Instead, let him consider that reason rather than a staff and a certain plan of life rather than a wallet are the mint marks of the cynic philosophy. It's not what you wear. It's not what you dress. It's not putting on the costume. It's not making a show that actually makes you a cynic. It is cultivating yourself philosophically, disciplining the body, even disciplining the soul. And then you're entitled to behave like a cynic and, and do all the sorts of things that they do because you're not a fraud. You're not a 
charlatan. You're not putting on airs. So this is how uh, Julian is, is framing what it means to really be a cynic. It involves discipline and it's aimed at a genuine kind of happiness that can only be enjoyed by those who do undergo that discipline through philosophy.